want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Welcome to all of our wonderful EMEA customers. So great, again, to see so many of you um, on the line, so many familiar faces. So happy that you guys could join us this afternoon. Um, we are here today to talk to you guys about the Web Focus Hub. Uh, so super excited um, for today's presentation, and we've got a lot of great information to share with you. So we won't waste any more time. Um, we will go ahead and jump in. There's a couple of things that I want to go over with you guys, just some updates on some resources, and then I'll turn it over to Angie and Dave, and we'll get started into all of the great content that they have for you guys today. Um, okay, uh, let's go. Let's see. Let's get through that. All right. So today's presenters, um, some of you guys are very familiar with our presenters. Angie Hildak and Dave Pfeiffer today will be discussing the hub. Uh, so we're super excited to have them with us. Angie is senior manager, manager of product development and Dave is our director of our user experience. So um, again, great presenters and uh, they have a lot of great content today. Welcome back, IBI.com. Um, for those of you who may not know, we have the IBI.com site back up and running. It is live and accessible to you. Um, a lot of the information, all the IBI stuff that you used to go to tibco.com for has now been moved back over to our own domain. Um, there are still a couple of things that um, might you might find are missing as you are um, you know, working your way through the website. And if you see something, just shoot us a note, let us know to make sure that we uh, move that back over. Um, we're trying to get as much over as we possibly can. Uh, so if you do see something missing, please raise your hand, let us know. But right now, currently, um, you can find all of our IBI products and solutions. Um, they are all listed on the homepage as well as through the drop down at the top where it says products. Um, you can find customer stories out here. We have all of our resources. So these are all of the on demand user groups, Focus Fridays, um, any other web focused webinars that, and iWay webinars that have taken place um, through our time since the acquisition with TIBCO will all be moved over under the resource section. Um, under the events section, you will find upcoming user groups, Focus Fridays, events, um, conferences, things like that. Um, we will be adding those as those are getting scheduled throughout the spring and the summer. Um, so be sure just to keep checking back for that um, to see you know, what's coming up in your area. Um, and then you still have access to support. It is at the bottom of the page. Um, where there is actually a, a link that does say support. And just a heads up, it still currently does take you back to TIBCO support site, um, but that will all, again, all of that will be reconfigured and changed in the upcoming like weeks and months. Um, but just a heads up that you still are in the right place, even though it will, um, you know, say uh, TIBCO. And then what's still coming from our site, uh, we are adding product documentation. So all of your product documents, we are continuing to add uh, new stuff um, and updating old stuff. So uh, you'll be seeing some additional uh, material uh, coming there. Uh, we will also be working on um, your education and training information, um, pulling that from TIBCO and you know rebranding that as IBI and, and getting new courses and things like that available and training available for you guys. So that is all still coming, um, as well as um, the community. We will be able to um, link the community over uh, to this page, so it'll be easy, uh, easy, easily more accessible to you guys as well. Um, speaking, of, uh, and then, um, so like I had mentioned um, about events, again, on the event page, this will show you upcoming user groups and Focus Fridays that uh, will be coming. Um, and again, this will be constantly updated as we get stuff planned. So. Just be sure to check this page out to stay in the know um, of when uh, things are coming up. And then speaking of community, so I know a lot of you guys have reached out and asked about what is, you know, what's going to happen with community? What are, you know, what are we doing? Um, currently, right now, we are going to be staying within the TIBCO community um, that was launched last summer. Um, most of you guys have registered and have moved into the community um, where you are able to access the Web Focus portal from there and then go into our own little Web Focus world. Um, I do hear, I, I've heard a lot of you guys, I've heard your feedback. Um, we are working on making some improvements. I know it hasn't been exactly the most user-friendly platform. Um, a lot of customers have you know, said they've had a little trouble finding um, some articles or where the threads are. 
Um, so we are working on some customer enablement to really uh, allow you guys to learn the community better, learn how to navigate it better, and um, be able to utilize it you know, while we are in the community. Um, future looking plans, we are looking to pull IBI and have our own community again. Um, again, that is a little bit further down the road. So if you guys could just bear with us for the time being, um, we will be still using this community, um, but we will make sure that you guys are well enabled and able to navigate and use this effectively. Um, within the community, we do have a private uh, web focus user group. group. Um, if you guys would like to join this, um, this is where at least another way that I can communicate with you guys um, and keep you updated on upcoming user groups and events. Um, easy, that way you can easily register. Um, you can participate in discussions and polls and surveys that we're asking within the group uh, to get your feedback on future user groups and the overall user group community. Um, and then as well as interacting with your uh, fellow user group community members. Um, so if you guys want to, um, once you log into the community at the top bar, there is a group section, and then this group is listed, just request to join and I can accept uh, your request. Um, so that was quick and easy for me. Um, that was really all I had to remind you guys of right now. Um, I know a lot of you guys have also asked about a summit. Um, and we are looking at trying to get something together um, possibly in EMEA, um, so something actually just for you guys over in EMEA. Um, so we're kind of working through those logistics and seeing you know, what that would possibly look like. So stay tuned for additional information on that. Um, we'll make sure that you guys stay in the loop and keep you guys um, you know, privy to, to whatever you know, we decide to do. Um, and on that note, I am gonna turn it over to Angie and Dave to get started. Um, a quick couple reminders. Yes, this is being recorded. I forgot to say this in the beginning, so I apologize. Uh, we are recording the webinar, uh, so you will receive a copy of the recording. And if you have any questions for Angie and Dave throughout the, the presentation, please submit those through the Q&A. Um, and we will, uh, they will answer them and we will get, um, we, will, we will address them for you guys. All right, Angie and Jay, Dave, excuse me, the floor is yours. Very good. Thanks, Shay. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here. Move a few things out of the way. All right. Thank you, Shay. Welcome, everybody. We're excited uh, that you're here today, and we've got some great stuff to, to share with you. Uh, so just a little bit about IBI, you know, as uh, Shay mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, um, you know, IBI is now uh, back to being a, a business unit of uh, Cloud Software Group. Uh, and as you'll see in today's presentation, uh, the brand is back uh, as a standalone business. Um, we're in the process of rolling back uh, the branding and our messaging uh, to what it was prior to the TIPCO acquisition in 2021. So that's really exciting news for all of us. Uh, but our mission and our um, our values have not changed. You know, we continue to help organizations harness the power of data and dr drive informed uh, decision making. And that's really why we're here today to share the latest developments in Web Focus, specifically in the Web Focus Hub. So we're we're very excited to to share some of this. So here's what we're going to cover today. I'll uh, cover an overview of uh, what the hub is, how we sort of conceptualize uh, that platform. And I'll give you an overview, a summary of some of the, the key features. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Angie. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna queue up some of those features and then Angie's gonna go into a live demo and show you how some of that works. And then hopefully we'll leave enough time for, for Q&A. All right. Okay, so what is the Web Focus Hub? Uh, so many of you might know what it is. Uh, it's been around since uh, September of 21. But for those of you who might not know what the hub is, it all started um, from, you know, a, a UX concept a few years back. Uh, I joined the, the UX team three years ago, and the team was already working on this concept. And what you see here is uh, the landscape of, of web focus several years ago. Um, it was, uh, you know, the tools that you, you use today, um, but they were sort of um, standalone tools. They all sort of did their own thing. People gravitated towards certain areas of the product. Certain people only like found themselves in one areas of the product. 
but some people, you know, um, utilize multiple areas. And for, for those people, it was a little bit confusing sometimes where to go to do what, how to trigger something. Uh, there's multiple places to trigger multiple things. And so we as, a, as a, a product team and a UX team, we knew that there was a lot of opportunity here to sort of bring all of this together. There was a lot of great value in the tools, but we wanted to enhance the user experience and create more of a, an intuitive entry point um, a launching point into into all these different areas. And this is just a, a sampling of them all. This isn't them all. Uh, I'm just trying to illustrate that uh, they were all sort of separate um, and there was a lot of uh, opportunity of um, bringing it more as a cohesive experience. And so that's where it all started. We had this idea and um, we knew that uh, there was a destination that we wanted to get to. It was going to take some time. And we all had, you know, design best practices in mind and ideas of what that could be in mind. But of course, we wanted to go out uh, and uh, gauge um, uh, information from our customers. What do our customers want and need? So we kicked off a bit of a, a research effort. Um, and this happened, you know, several years ago, as I said. Um, you know, we hosted uh, some user forums, some focus groups. We gathered feedback directly from our customers through our support channel. Uh, and through all of these different activities, we started to, um, you know, define uh, clear definitions of our different types of users, our audience. Um, and here's a, a sampling of, you know, what we what we knew, but that we, you know, uh, learned through those uh, exercises and documented into a series of visuals. So, you know, traditionally, you know, for the past, you know, many years, on the left side of this screen you know, the, the products were catered more towards business analysts, the BI developers and BI administrators. And they all knew the team, the, the product very well and their, their specific areas. But there was a big opportunity for some new uh, user types. And those that's what we're representing over on the right-hand side, uh, you know, in the data management side, business users, data scientists, uh, et cetera. And so uh, through all this learning, you know, we started to create visuals uh, that sort of depicted who these users were and what their pain points and their needs were. And we put together a series of uh, visuals like this, mostly for our own internal purposes so that we can better learn about each user type and we can share them throughout the organization. So everybody is learning what we're learning. You know, we're sharing back with them. And so they look something like this. We put uh, faces and names and titles to the different user types. We identify specific characteristics, needs, pain points, and goals for each user. We document their journeys through the product in you know different ways, all for the purpose of really being able to um, you know to cater to each different user type. Web Focus is a big platform that does many different things, and we're trying to make it feel more personal and. Um, you know, relatable for each individual user type because everybody's different. Everybody has a different journey and a different role in their organization. And so after going through all that and all the exercises and speaking with all the people, you know, there was a, a set of um, opportunities, a, a theme of areas of focus that was sort of woven throughout, throughout all the feedback, no matter which uh, type of person that we were we were speaking to. And these are the common themes. These are uh, uh, some of them, not all of them, but these are the, the biggest ones that, that we decided to tackle. Um, enablement, uh, new enhanced workflows, smart areas to trigger workflows throughout the product, not just one way, but others, other ways, but in a very smart and intuitive way. Discoverability, you know, finding out things that people might not have been aware of. Um, you know, how can the system push things to people or how can they just uh, find things that they're looking for more easily? Uh, relevancy, how can the system, you know, put um, things that might be pertinent to me, the work that I'm doing, uh, the types of, uh, you know, other other similar roles who are looking for content, how can uh, the, the information that I see in the platform be more relevant? Contextual experiences, again, personalized to me, it knows who I am and what I do, and it's, it's uh, you know, surfacing those types of things so it feels more personalized. Uh, and of course, everybody wants it to be enriched with intelligence. Help me do things. Help me learn how to do things. 
um because not everybody knows everything about the platform so a smart system a smart platform that makes it more intuitive and easy to use so these were the common themes that we uncovered and what we tried to build into this concept of the hub and so you know cut to several years later uh, we now have uh what you see here this is the web focus hub so all of those um exercises, the learning that we did, understanding our users, understanding our product, how can we bring it all together? How can we touch on each of those common themes? Uh, this gave rise to the birth of the Web Focus Hub. So as I said, we launched this back in uh, September of 21. I think it was 8207.28. That was the first iteration. And then in 90, 91, 9, uh, 92 coming up, you know, we continue to make enhancements over time and, and build upon uh, what we released in the uh, first edition. And so what I'm going to cover today is some of those key features. I'll try to give you a breakdown of when we release those. Some of those details are a little fuzzy at this point, but I'll try to uh, make that as clear as I can. So here is a uh, an overview of some of these features. And again, I'll go very high level because Angie's going to be giving you demos of, of all these things uh, going forward. Um, so uh, the first uh, and foremost thing um, is that the hub is a responsive experience. So not all areas of the web focus platform are responsive. Um, they're very complex tools with you know complex functions and interactions, and they require a bit of a bigger screen. But you know we're treating the hub as a bit of a consumption layer and like i said we're trying to hit this new audience this business user this consumer type people who are looking for uh assets trying to make decisions off them and then use them in presentation sharing them with people they're not the builders they're more of the consumers and so uh, the hub really caters to that audience very much it still triggers the workflows to all those other things for all the other user types but the hub itself is sort of the consumption platform. It's the front door into all those different areas. And so we felt like it was important to make this front door mobile accessible. So many of these business users are on the go. They're using um, you know, laptops, small laptops, other touchscreen devices. And so we tried to cater to, to those folks. So um, it will work. You can find stuff. You can interact with stuff. There's some limited functionality because you're on mobile devices, but it's still there and it works for, for those people that are on the go. Um, the recents and favorites. So we initially launched um, the 820728, the first iteration of the hub, uh, with recents and favorites, but they were uh, primarily recents and favorites in the uh, the client side of repository. Um, and so what we did was in the 9.0 release, we um, launched a view of recents and favorites now with the ability to see recents in the content side and in the data side. And you can see them here. There's a toggle. Uh, there's a content tab and a data tab. So it's not a true unified view, but this one area for favorites and the area for recents now exposes all of your uh, content side uh, information and your data side information. So that was a, a, a vast Im improvement, being able to bring that all here into one unified interface. You can see down the left-hand side of the screen, there's a series of tabs. We happen to be looking at the, the home view now. So the hub sort of encompasses uh, the old uh, web focus homepage. This is your, your new starting point with your recents, your favorites, as I said, but then there's also the the area for things that are shared with you from others, uh, your personal workspace, those areas, um, the things that you save there will show up here as well as getting started if your uh, organization has enabled that. And then some of the other relevant areas down the left-hand side, we've got separate um, repositories for your client-side workspaces, your server-side application directory. So each of those can be accessed here. No longer do you have to go to those respective areas. You can, you can access them all from this one landing page. We also, also have a, an area for portals, um, which used to be um, accessible on the Web Focus uh, homepage. Now it has its own dedicated plugin here. Uh, there's a place for uh, administration. So we brought all the administration from Web Focus together into this one platform. So this little uh, person icon with the cog down here that launches your administration console, and that's where you can administer um, and configure the platform for uh, for all the areas of Web Focus. 
And then the last but not least is search, and I'll cover that in a few minutes. Uh, so, you know, as you can imagine, uh, you know, the first slide that I went over, the ecosystem, there's a lot of different areas, and each of them sort of had their own unique look and feel. There's, you know, 40 plus years of, of design work and engineering work there. And so one of the challenges that we had in bringing this all together into one launching point was streamlining the UI, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're bringing all those different areas together here into a, a central launching point, but, you know, we wanted to make it feel like it was one platform, like we were not bringing together 10 different areas of the product with 10 different designs and witnessing, you know, experiencing those 10 different designs here in one area. So uh, we spent quite a, a, a while overhauling the UI to make it look and feel consistent. You'll see common use of color, typography, placement of certain buttons, uh, you know, being able to trigger workflows from the different areas of the hub that I just mentioned in similar ways. So we created this set of uh, toolbars that sort of sit up across the top of each um, uh, plugin area with a similar set of controls. I can change the view uh, to whether I want it to be um, tile view or list view. I can sort them. I can refresh them. I can organize things in a certain way. Uh, that's common now across all these different areas, common controls. I can trigger um, workflows from uh, the plus content uh, button and the menu system here in workspaces or a similar button, a plus data button over in the application directory side. So you can see how we spent uh, quite a bit of time in taking uh, special care to make sure that as you navigate through the different areas of the hub, that really feels like one platform. It's one cohesive platform that then uh, gives you access to all the, the other areas um, within. So this was a this was a, a challenge for us, and I think it's a real vast improvement uh, at bringing it together and making it a, a highly usable experience. Yeah, Dave, there was one question that came in um, and maybe you want to touch on uh, how different buttons may disappear on smaller screen sizes. Yeah, so as I said, um, when I covered the responsive side, certain things um, certain things we decided were not going to be accessible on mobile. Um, we are treating mobile as more of a consumption platform. So you might see that any of the trigger points to, uh, to create certain things, creation of content, a lot of buttons and actions will be removed in those smaller experiences uh, just because they launch tools that are not mobile accessible, right? And so we're trying to make um, the mobile experience as usable as possible. And we don't want to launch you into a tool that was never intended to be mobile accessible. So there might still be a few areas that we're, we're enhancing where maybe certain things should be available on mobile. And that's what we continue to, to iterate on. But for the most part, if something is not there, it's because we've intentionally left it out of mobile and it's because that's not a good experience. It was not usable and we don't want to show anything in those areas that is not usable, okay? I hope that answers the question. Um, and so the next couple of screens, um, you know, Angie is gonna dive more in depth on. Um, so I'll go at, at a high level, um, but one of the, the bigger features that we launched, I think in the, the nine dot, Oh, keep me honest, Angie. When when did Explore Data launch? The first iteration was 9.0, right? Yep. Yep. Um, so in Explore Data, uh, it's a dialogue that launches from the hub, and it's got two separate um, areas that you can interact with. There's a, a an Ask a Question tab uh, and the Get Insights tab. This screen is for the Get Insights tab. So many of you might be aware that um, Get Insights or sometimes referred to as instant insights, uh, that feature exists over in Designer. When you launch uh, the author mode of Designer to create a visualization, you select your data source, there's a tab in that left navigation bar for insights. And from there, you can you know, generate a set of automated insights like you're seeing here. You can add them to your canvas and you can do many great things with them. Well, we know that that, um, that feature is very powerful, has a lot of value for a lot of users. And we know that you know some of these user types that we're, we're trying to uh, 
to cater more to like this business user segment, they don't always go to designer to create things. Like we said, this is more of a consumption platform and there's a set of uh, individuals who are gonna focus most of their time here on the hub and not even use any of those other tools. So we said, well, let's make that insights feature portable. Let's take the exact functionality, the way it works over in designer and we'll now expose it over in the hub. So I no longer have to launch the tool in order to experience it and get value out of it. I can do it right here from the hub. So from the plus menu, you know, I go to the plus menu, I go down to explore data and it launches this dialogue. And from there, it's basically the same experience on the Get Insights tab as you see in Designer. I pick my data source and now it generates the insights. It could have uh, multi-fact tables in it, uh, what have you. So uh, as the insights are generated, it gives me a set of tabs. It helps me navigate. Um, you know, there could be many accordions, many answers uh, for each of the different tabs. And now I can browse everything that the system has generated for me and I can take action with them. I can either run them to a new window or I can save each individual one uh, to a workspace and then I can do whatever I want with that. I can share it. I can go over and uh, create something with it if I want to, or I can give it to somebody else to go create something with. Um, so it's the same feature as in Designer. We're just now plugging it into uh, the hub here. And we're looking at other ways to uh, this feature could add value for, for other users in different areas of the platform. Similarly, the first tab um, is NLQ. And I think this one launched a little bit later. I think the, the first iteration of Explore Data was only Get Insights. And then a short while later, we, at, we uh, added the NLQ feature, the Ask a Question tab. And so here, um, you know, I can toggle back and forth between these two tabs. So while the Get Insights tab was the system generating uh, automatic insights based on the data set and looking for those types of things, the Ask a Question allows the user to uh, use natural language query. That's what NLQ stands for. I can ask a question against that data set. I can ask any question I want. I can, um, you know, use the drop down. There's a bit of a type ahead where the system is showing me the, the, the column types, the values that are available to ask questions against. So it tries to give me a little bit of help about how I can structure my question, but I could ask it any way that I want. And you can see it gives me a, a, a nice result um, when I ask that. So um, Angie's gonna go into a demonstration of how valuable this is, but it's really easy to toggle back and forth and be able to see uh, insights um, that the system is generating and then also uh, generate my own and then use those the same way. I have the actions I can save uh, or run to a new window. Um, the search experience. So of course, search is always a big pain point in any platform and search is always um, you know, a difficult thing. Uh, people are always looking for something. They might remember bits and pieces about it. They don't remember the entire name. They don't remember where it was located, who created it. So search um, always sort of falls short of people's expectations. So we took a lot of care to, um, to really make this a smart and intuitive search and provide as many, you know, um, expected, uh, you know, ways to search as possible. You can see it's a similar type of layout from like the home area and the other areas that I was showing you. I can, you know, sort, I can view by tile, list view, I can sort it up and down or by different categories. But on the left-hand side is where sort of the advanced controls come in. I can search all, all items across all the repositories. I can search only content. I can search only data. I can use wildcards uh, and characters. If I you know, how, know how to do that, I'm an advanced uh, searcher and I know uh, how to use those features. Or I can use the set of dropdowns and sort of filter and narrow the results by you know, different categories, different types, or within specific areas. And I can search. Um, important to note, this is a unified set of results. So what you're seeing here is a combination of content items and data items across all those rep repositories. If you recall, the first uh, screen that I show you was the recents and favorites on the home area, and we had the tabs for content and data. We, we still had those items separated behind those tabs. Well, over the next couple of releases, I think um, search released in 9.1, we were able to unify those results into one area. So we no longer needed the content and data tabs to toggle between those two. We're now showing you everything together into one unified. 
And so we plan to roll this sort of new unified view back to the other areas. So those are some enhancements that we plan to make, um, you know, taking what we did here in search and applying them back to other areas. So eventually the content and data tabs will go away and it'll just be all content, and all data in one unified view. Um, also coming up, we have some new enhancements that we're working on for the next release in the search area. And it's around uh, the things that I can do, the actions that I can take on these individual items. So there were some limitations with bringing these things together, as I mentioned, into one unified view. There were certain actions that uh, were just not feasible at the time. So we had limited actions. I would right click and I would uh, navigate to where that item sort of lived in the repository or in the directory. And then I would launch my, my workflows from there. Well, now in the upcoming release, I'm going to be able to do that right from here. So it sort of saves a few clicks. It streamlines it a bit. I can take action from a right-click menu here. I can view properties on any asset right from here. So all the things that you used to be able to do, but it just saves you a few clicks. I can do it right here from the search screen, and I don't have to go to uh, the actual directory where it lives in, in in its own repository. So those are some upcoming enhancements. We're very excited about those, and they're, they're really going to add value and, and streamline the workflow, I bet. And last but not least, and I don't want to steer Angie's thunder because this is uh, generating a lot of excitement. We're going to get, you know, we, we anticipate a lot of uh, good feedback on this. Um, but, you know, we've, we've heard from many, many folks over the years that they want to be able to white label. They want to be able to make web focus uh, look and feel like their own organization. Because many of, many, uh, you know, organizations embed web focus into their own tools and they don't want it to look and feel like like web focus it's achievable today but it's a um it's a an elaborate process it requires engineers and technology and documentation and uh so while it's achievable our goal was to make it even more user friendly and so what we did was we're introducing in an upcoming release i think it's uh, the next release in 9.2 the white labeling feature. So administrators can go to their management center. There'll be a new area for white labeling. And from here, you know, they themselves can, you know, upload their own brand assets. They can update a color palette if they have capability to do so. Uh, and if they need the help of like their design teams, their branding teams, their marketing teams um, to provide that information, we're providing a way to, uh, to share some of that, to download the theme share it with those folks. They can make the updates as needed, share it back with the admin. The admin uploads it. We parse the information and voila. So, you know, what I'm showing here is just a uh, a sampling of, you know, what it could look like, you know, no matter what brand I'm I'm working for, what no matter what color palette my organization has, I can pretty much achieve something very, very close, if not exact, using this new tool. So we're excited to share that with you. Uh, and so with no further ado, I will hand it over to Angie to show you some of that goodness that I just uh, talked through. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right. Let me get my screen shared here. Making sure I select the right one. All right. Um, so... Web Focus Hub. Um, so what I'm gonna demo today is a little bit of the hub overall, um, some of that explore data that Dave had mentioned, uh, some of the search, and then at the very end, we'll have a, a quick preview of what the white labeling will look like as well. Um, so this is a early environment of our upcoming 9.2 release. Um, so that, that's where, uh, to show the white labeling, had to get that early environment. Um, but all the other pieces are available in 9.1 as well. So other than the white labeling, everything that you see here will be available in 9.1. Um, okay, so when I first log in, uh, I logged in as an admin here just because I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, different, uh, different aspects here. But no matter who I've logged in as, whether it's an admin, a author user or a developer, a, um, a basic user or a runtime user, no matter who I'm logged in as, I land on the hub. And where I land initially, my very first time coming in, is in the home area of the hub. Um, and so this has the recents that Dave had mentioned, uh, the favorites. Um, and also, so in that recents, we have that combination of content and data assets. 
I also have my workspace, which is a collection of all of my, my content folders across all of my different workspaces in the repository. Um, I also have the favorites as well, which again has that unified view. Um, I think I may have gotten timed out here. I logged in at the beginning of our session. So let me just do a, a quick refresh here and make sure I didn't get signed out accidentally. is on my local machine and so zoom may be slowing it down a little bit as well sorry about this guys uh dave and shay you're still able to to hear me connected okay right it's not my internet yes we hear you fine yeah we hear you fine These are just the demo gremlins. Right? It worked perfectly when I tested this morning. Let me try one more time. I think it may also be, I have a couple of other windows open as well in the background, might be why. Okay, let's try this again. All right, so I have my recents. I go to my workspace. Here we go. I see all of the uh, files in my various my content folders across my repository. I go to my favorites, and I again I'm seeing both my content and data favorites, uh, whether I, I it's a favorite in my repository or in my application directories. Um, over on the side here, I have my workspaces, which is the the content view, repository view, workspaces view. It has a, had has had a couple of names over the years. Um, I see all my files here. Uh, I also have application directories and something I want to point out, something new that we added um, in 9.1 release was the ability to choose your reporting server that you're connecting to. So I only have one set up in this environment, but if you're in a clustered model where you have multiple reporting servers connected to one client, you can actually choose your reporting server from the drop down up here and see all the files appropriately for that server. Also in the administration area, it's a combined administration. I have my client administration, my server administration, and here again, I can select my server if I have multiple servers. So now I don't need to open five separate windows to get to my five reporting server uh, configurations. I can do it all directly from the hub. All right, so let's go back to workspaces. Um, and I'm going to go into that explore data area. So it's from the plus menu up here in the corner. I click plus and go to explore data. And I'm going to select a sample file that I have, a loans file. This one. And so in here, you see I have the two buttons. I, I have ask a question and get insights. Um, and the, the ask a question is our NLQ functionality uh, where I can ask questions in real time, get insights is where I'll have the, those automatically generated uh, insights to my data. Um, inside of the explore data window, if I decide, oh, I don't want to work on the loans file, I want to work on a different file, I can switch easily. I have an option for switch data source and it just brings up the same dialogue. I can choose a new, new data source from there. Um, or I can just stick with my same data source. Uh, and really the power of this is it allows me to go into my data and really do multiple things with it and really just explore it. Uh, so I'm, I'll have some insights coming up here. I'm sorry my machine is running so slowly today. Um, I think uh, I think Zoom may be affecting it. This happened last time as well. Uh, so, I can run my insights, look at some of the results there. Based on the result that I'm getting, I can switch back and ask a question. Um, so for example, on my loans file, I can, um, let's see, here's the insights, okay. Uh, so on my insights, I have three different columns here, three different types of insights, whether it's a single column, pairs of columns, time series, um, and I get different uh, different results back. So like individual is the most frequent value of application type, uh, or uh, maybe I have a, a histogram of interest rate values that I wanna look at. 
that um, shows in different bins or different buckets the uh, um, varying interest rates. Um, so as I'm looking at this, like I, I see my application types are individual or joint. I see my, my various interest rates and I go, okay, well, that's good information, but what are the interest rates by the application type? Is there a, a correlation there? So let me just go over and ask that question. So let me say, what is the average interest rate? And as I'm typing, you'll see like the column names are, are filling in automatically based on what I'm typing. So I don't need to know the column names. I can just select them. Um, interest rate by application type. And when I ask this question, it's gonna give me a, a table result, uh, just a um, um, tabular result right now, report output, table file output, whatever you wanna call it. Um, coming in the future, we will be supporting visualization output as well. Uh, so here's my result and I can see it, it broke it down by term as well. And so I can see the interest rate for individual and joint, see how they compare. Uh, for the shorter term, 36 months, individual has the lower interest rate, but for the longer term, 60 months, joint has the lower interest rate there. So then what do I do with all these things? I'm exploring this and this is useful to me. I see the answers, but it just for me, it, it may not be enough. And maybe I wanna share it with someone else. And so this is where I can save my results as well. So on my answer that I get from the NLQ, I can choose save to a workspace. I'm gonna make sure I'm in my Archer folder and I'm gonna call this interest rate by app type. Uh, I'm gonna start it with EXP because I found it in the explore area. And I can do that with my insights as well. So also on my insights, I can choose uh, any of the insights that are relevant and that, that I want to share with other people. And similarly, save this to a, a um, workspace folder. So I'll say this is the application types. Save that. And I'll come down and the interest rates as well was interesting to me. That's what prompted my question. So I'm going to save this one as well. All right, so I have these three things and um, I, I am working on them. I've saved a couple of them and now I get interrupted. That's how it goes in probably most of our jobs. I get a phone call, I get a Slack message from someone uh, saying, can you look into this thing? I, I need to, uh, I need an answer by, by 1 p.m. or by 4 p.m. On, uh, on a certain result. So I come back later and I don't have my Explore data window open anymore. I've done a couple of things. Maybe I've clicked through some, to some of my other workspaces to accommodate that request. And now I can't remember my, where I saved my files. I don't know where I put them. That's where the search comes in and where, what the search is really helpful for. All I can remember is that I, I started all of my files starting with EXP because it was from the Explore data area. That's all I need to know. I can do that search on EXP. And now looking here, I, I actually see all three of those files that I had saved. And like Dave said, I can take action on those in, in the upcoming release as well, where I can come in and uh, I'm using shift click here, highlight three of them, right click on it and say publish. And you'll see all those icons have, have changed now. They're published to the uh, Archer workspace. So now I, I ask my developer, my author, the one who, who's proficient in designer, and I say, hey, I have these three files. Can you put them on a portal for me? Or can you add them to a page for me? Um, so I'm actually gonna switch windows now and switch over to a developer user. Let me just refresh here and make sure I didn't get logged out. All right. So here uh, in my workspaces area, I have access as a developer, access to this Archer folder, and I can see the, those three new files, the, the explore files. And um, now I wanna add those to a page like my, my uh, coworker had asked me to do. So I can open up designer uh, in the assemble mode. 
drag those three pieces of content to the page. Uh, so I'll put application types there. Um, interest rates next to it. Um, that, that combined view that shows both of them above it. Let's rearrange a little here. All right. Um, but I know that my, my coworker, like just these questions is, is uh, it's good. I, I have this content, but I know my coworker is going to want to ask more questions in the future. Uh, so something that we added in release 9.1 is a new explore data container in designer as well. And what this does is it actually brings the NLQ functionality into a designer page. Um, so when I first drag it onto the page, I uh, have the option to, or well, I have to select my data source, uh, which data source I wanna ask questions against. So I'm gonna choose that same one, that loans file. Um, I can change the display name as well. Like this one has a pretty long name. Um, so I'm gonna just shorten it to say loans. And then uh, I'm just gonna do a quick preview on this to show you that, that result and that output. So now here in container four, you see like I'm exploring loans. If I had added multiple files here, I could go through and select which file I wanna ask questions against. And then I can ask another question here as well. Um, so maybe what is the average loan amount by application type? And click on ask and I'm gonna get that same sort of tabular output uh, as a result here. I'm showing me the average loan amount by the application type. And so once this is in my page, I can put it into a portal, I can publish it, send the link out to maybe multiple users, and then really all of my runtime users, whether they're named in Web Focus or not, has access then to ask questions and use this NLQ functionality. Angie, we have a, a quick search question um, since you, you covered search a little while ago. Can we search for anything inside the context of effects or an HTML? Yeah, we're we're working on that. Um, so the the uh, let's see, I, I think it was not quite finished for the 9.2 release. We it is still in progress though, because it is um, we know it's a priority for everyone to be able to search those contents of files. Um, so coming soon, just not in the the immediate next release. Um, yeah, and then there's another question here. Uh, what about NLQ in non-English languages? Also a coming soon item. Uh, we're, we're looking into that, especially um, in regards to uh, things like the fuzzy matching, handling misspellings, being able to understand things like average and uh, month names and some of those pieces, um, adding complexity, being able to support the other languages. So again, coming soon. All right. Um, lots of questions. Great. Uh, so do the questions, should they be specified or should they be in a specific word order? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's natural language queries. And so you can kind of ask in, um, whatever order you want. Um, I, for demonstration purposes, I had a couple of prepared ones here so I could get the, the, uh, results quickly um, by, yeah, natural language, it doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, your your column names, you're gonna need to be specific on those, but as you saw, as I was typing those in, I could just select them from the list. So it made that really easy. And then can you export the dashboard and or schedule it for delivery? Um, I guess uh, in terms of having sort of an offline dashboard, I think is where that question is going. Uh, so. The NLQ functionality does require connection to the DSML services. Um, and so the ask a question functionality isn't available offline, uh, either scheduled or downloaded at all. Um, and the other uh, export, um, we have some options there. Uh, we, these are kind of like um, slightly older uh, features in terms of releases, but we have options here for exporting the entire dashboard as you're seeing it on the screen to PDF images. Um, 
And uh, we also have the document mode in Designer now that uh, you can create those native PDF outputs as well. Okay, thanks Dave for managing all the, uh, the, the logistics of answering these. <laughs> I'm doing my best here. <laughs> um, let's see. Does NLQ recognize non-American date formats? Uh, the date recognition we are improving. Um, I would have to check what is currently supported. I, I know it is more than just like the standard month, day, year, um, but maybe um, we can follow up on that one to get you the full list of what is supported there. Um, can we save our frequently used questions? Very good question. And that is on our roadmap. Um, hoping for uh, kind of like a, a 12 to 18 month time frame on that. Um, but that is uh, being able to reuse questions, save questions, um, also potentially share questions with other people. Uh, we're, we're looking into a lot of those options. Okay. So I'm going to answer one more right now, which was, can you brand this page and or can you support multiple domains? Um, so styling and designer has been around for a while. I can um, change the colors, uh, change the theme of it, no issues. But this is a perfect segue into the white labeling where I can style all of web focus. Um, so let me go back to my environment here. I'm going to close a couple of windows. I'm going to leave this developer open, though. And let me switch back to my admin. Okay, um, so let's take a look at the white labeling. So over in my administration area, I have a new section here, white labeling. And this is where I'm gonna do all of my branding and white labeling configurations. Um, so when I come into white labeling, well, hopefully I didn't get signed out again. I was testing timeouts on this machine the other day and I, I may have messed myself up a little bit. My developers still logged in. No issues there. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Okay. Um, so here I'm white labeling. Uh, this is where I'm going to control all of the various white labeling that I can do. I have a global on or off switch for it. Um, and when I turn that on, I get access to all the different things that I can change. Um, so you see here on the screen, um, I can change logos, I can change favicons, I can change the text that is in my browser tab. So right now up here where it says IBI Web Focus homepage, I can change that text. I can also fully change my color palette as well. Um, so let me go through and change a couple of these things. Um, so I can choose a new favicon. I, um, instead of IBI Web Focus Hub, Maybe I want that to be my company's name, World Class Enterprises Inc. Um, I can change multiple different logos as well. Uh, so I can change the hub, the web focus homepage, the reporting server logo. So this one is going to show up uh, in the data flow areas. If I um, open the server console from um, some of the, the uh, hub access points, I can change designer as well. Um, so the logo and designer, if I don't want it to say IDI Web Focus Designer, I can change my logo there. And then again, I can also change my browser tab labels. So I can prefix all of them with WCE for my world-class enterprises. And as I'm making these changes, nothing's updating live. I click Save. But you'll see, as soon as I click Save here, I'm already seeing the changes take effect. My logo has changed up in my banner. My favicon in the browser has changed. I get that new WCE homepage text in the browser tab. And then I can also come and change my color palette. So here I can type in hex values. Uh, maybe I wanna use like more of an orangish um, theme to my, my hub here. Um, so I'm gonna type in a couple of codes. Um, 
and I can click save and I can, I can start to see those take effect, like especially in the hovering, um, the, the text, a uh, couple of the buttons, especially. Uh, if I know all of my hex values, I can just go through and type all these in. But maybe I want to work with someone else in my organization, maybe a marketing person or someone from corporate branding. And they really have a definition of all of the colors that we need to use for our organization. So what I can do is actually download my um, text, uh, like a text file of all these colors. And let me pull this over to the other screen. Um, and so what you see here is a current version of the colors that I've set up. Uh, so it has all of the colors listed, um, all the different hex codes. I can now send this out to my coworker, whether it's corporate branding or whoever it is and say, hey, give me all the right colors that we want to display here. Um, after I've downloaded it, sent it out, they send it back to me with all the right values. What do I do with it? Uh, so that's where the upload comes in. So I have a couple of examples already in here. Um, I'm going to choose this first one, which continues that orange sort of theme to it. Once I hit upload, you see all of my uh, different values here change to more of an orange and gray theme. I can click Save, and we'll see that take effect in my entire view. So if I switch over to my developer, though, I'm not going to see any of those changes. Let me just refresh to, to show. Um, None of those changes are there. Why? Uh, well, because as I'm working on a white labeling theme, as I'm playing around with things, I, I don't want to necessarily show everyone what these colors are until I know for sure it's exactly how I want it to look. And, and I have all the colors right. The contrast is enough for, for all of my accessibility requirements and everything. Once I've, I've finished all of it and I'm ready to go, ready to show it to everyone else, I click on this publish button up in the corner. So I get a little success message saying it, everything is published now. If I switch back over to my developer and refresh, I already see my favicon, I see the new text, and I'm seeing all those colors, all those logo changes uh, for the developer user now as well. Um, and then I mentioned that this also carries through to designer, right? So when I open up designer, I see the text initially until it changes to the file name. And then also in designer, uh, like all of my icons here have updated, my background has changed, all of my check boxes, everything matches what my company styling looks like. All right, so one more step here. Um, so this is great. I have an active styling that I've applied, an active white labeling that I've applied, and maybe I wanna play around with other options. So I'm gonna upload another um, pink theme that I had created. Uh, I originally created it for Valentine's Day. Um, so you see like all, all the variations, um, a lot of pink colors here. I can play around with this. I can save it. It's only going to affect me. So even though I've saved it for myself, my developer user over here, not seeing any of those changes yet. So if I want to change the theme, maybe with the season or like uh, we were talking about, we're going from Tibco branding back to IBI branding. If I am going through a change like that at another company, I need to update my branding. I can play around with these new colors without affecting what's already published to all the users. It's not until I click publish again that everyone else will see that. But this was a Valentine's Day theme and Valentine's Day is over. So I don't need this one anymore. I don't want to use it anymore. Uh, and so if I want to go back to what was last published to all of my users, I can choose the revert to last published. And um, it gives you a little bit of a warning saying anything that you've currently saved uh, will be lost because it will be taking the last published view instead. And when I click that and come back, you'll see I changed back to that originally published theme. And then the last button in here, uh, important one, is the reset to default. Um, so I call this the factory reset button. It uh, removes all of the white labeling for everyone uh, published, myself, doesn't matter. Um, and really just resets all of the settings for everyone back to the default web focus theming. All right. 
So let's take a look at the questions. Um, there's one, can you brand this page or can you support multiple domains? Um, that was the question we got uh, when we did the, the North America user group last week as well. Um, we are working on that. We uh, The way this is configured is um, designed to support that in the future. So it's not in the initial 9.2 release, uh, but we are working on that, uh, looking at that for a future release. See. Angie, I left the first one there for you too. It's a question about App Studio support. Yeah. Yeah. How long will you support App Studio? Um, when will you move all the features to the hub? We are actively working on that. Um, so in terms of how long we'll support App Studio until the functionality gap is closed and you're able to do um all of the things that you need to do uh, in App Studio currently, able to do those in the hub or designer. Um, we're going to continue to support App Studio. Uh, we are actively working on closing that functionality gap, especially in designer. Um, so there, there's been a lot of enhancements in uh, 9.0, 9.1, uh, and upcoming in 9.2 as well. Um, things like document mode, interactions in Designer, which uh, are similar to the tasks and animations in HTML pages in App Studio, uh, being able to create hold files. Um, so we're working on that gap. Hopefully, and maybe in the next six to twelve months, we'll have that uh, have that gap closed. And um, but like I said, we'll continue to support App Studio until that gap is fully closed. Uh, does this include the ability to edit App Studio created HTML pages? Um, so that one is a little bit tricky uh, because App Studio HTML pages and designer pages are um, structurally internally very different from each other. Uh, it is something we're reviewing to determine some sort of migration path there. Um, for sure, any of your existing content uh, will will continue to. Um, support as you go through upgrades. Uh, in terms of editing that content, we're still looking into a couple of options. Let's see. Do you move all features to App Studio or App Studio will open the web browser with this functionality? Um, so it's gonna be a little bit of a mix of both. Um, so the uh, currently in App Studio, the charting capabilities in App Studio have been replaced with uh, Infosys charting already. Um, we are working on that with Designer. Um, trying The main focus is bringing App Studio's functionality into Designer and just having it accessed from Designer in the browser, in the web browser. Um, but we are looking at, as well at um, as things improve, uh, you may see some changes in App Studio that uh, are web-based tools being brought into App Studio as well. Okay. And then uh, does the branding reflect into the visualization styles? Um, so currently, no. And the reason for that is because we didn't want my definition of the hub's branding or of my tool's branding to change someone's report output or page output without their decision to do that. Um, so we have heard that feedback of, um, and we're, we're looking into like, is there a way to create a theme based on the white labeling defined here that could then be used in the visualizations, reports, pages, and portals. Um, so we're looking into that, but as of right now, uh, no, it does not reflect in the visualization styles intentionally because we didn't want to assume anything about the designers of those visualizations. <clears throat> and then, um, let's see, we're getting a lot of designer questions. Um, will designer JavaScript development contain debugging features, for example, breakpoints? Um, we're actually, this is another like little bit of a preview. In release 9.2, we're actually improving the error, error handling of JavaScript in Designer, um, like in the custom JavaScript of Designer. Um, a couple of improvements there to, to highlight errors and uh, kind of give warnings when there are errors in the JavaScript code there. Um, so please look forward to it. Okay. 
see, how are we doing on time? Uh, Looks like we have about another eight minutes or so. Okay, I will keep answering questions. Uh, okay, let's see. Will you improve documentation to support features available in Web Focus and the Hub? Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our documentation is updated all the time. Every feature we, we implement, our documentation teams involved to, to um, work on that and document that. Um, it, it's still, uh, content is still in progress, but for white labeling especially, we're going to have a special help icon here that you can click on to um, get to the white labeling specific documentation, some tips there as well. Angie, I'll add to that. We are looking at ways to make that um, help content more accessible, leverage some of the videos that have been created um, more easily within the product. You know, there's a lot of great videos out on YouTube. So uh, in addition to the regular help content uh, in the help system, we're always looking to, to figure out ways of surfacing that in a smarter way throughout the experience. Thanks. Okay. Um, there is a question of, does NLQ work with analysis services cubes? Um, I believe so, I will say. Uh, I have not tested it personally, so I, it's hard for me. I come from a support background, so it's hard for me to say 100% unless I confirm it by myself. Um, so I believe so, though. Uh, I think there are some... Um, things to watch out for uh, that you want to go against one table or what is seen as one table uh, when you're asking your questions. So um, if there are specific use cases, uh, I would say reach out to support and they can contact us on product management and um, we can review any of those specific use cases. Right. Uh, can you modify visualization styles as a collection versus one by one? Um, so if you are using a theme, like a custom defined theme, uh, you can modify that theme and then every visualization using that theme will be updated. Um, so the, the themes are really powerful in that sense. Um, in terms of other customizations, like a, a, if there's been a, a color defined in one specific visualization or more likely in like 10 specific visualizations. Um, if it's not tied to one of those shared themes, uh, we you, you do still have to go through and, and modify those one by one. But um, I would encourage the use of themes because it does make that process a little bit easier. You can just change the theme and have all of them update. Awesome. I ran out of questions, so either type some more or uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see what other sort of comments people have. <laughs> A lot of great questions though. I appreciate the feedback, everyone. All right. I don't see any more coming in, so. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> Um, chart will chart features be available not only in code but also UI. We're working on that. That's part of our feature gap closure. Um, so coming soon. And then estimated release date for 9.2. Um, I we're we're working on that release date. Um, I would say keep an eye on the uh, announcement emails if you signed up for on e delivery to get the announcements of when new releases are available. Um, and should be coming very soon. All right. All right. Any Thanks. other questions for Angie or Dave? Fantastic content, guys. A lot of great things coming. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start wrapping us up. But if you guys have questions, please feel free to still submit those and we'll make sure that we gather all of those before we log off. But um, just as we're closing, um, again, as a reminder, um, this today's session was recorded and I will be sending out a copy of this recording to you guys here um, 
probably by end of day, if not early tomorrow. Uh, so you will get a copy of that along with a copy of the presentation, um, the PowerPoints that Dave went through at the beginning. Um, and of course, my, my stuff that I talked about in the beginning. So you'll have those links. Um, another reminder, guys, our, Dave had mentioned it, our social media, um, YouTube, we have our YouTube channel up and running. So you guys are more than welcome to go out there and view some of those demos and um, some of our, all of our on-demand recordings are out there as well. Um, we are getting all of that stuff also on the website. So you'll have both places to look. Um, we have our LinkedIn community out there, um, our IBI LinkedIn. We'd love for you guys to join and follow for that. And we also have our Twitter. So I will include all of those links um, in my follow-up email um, that you guys can have quick, easy access to that, to, that you could subscribe and follow us um, on our social media platforms. Um, Angie, Dave, thanks again. You guys are amazing. You guys are great. Thank you for joining us today and, and presenting all this awesome material. Um, and it looks like there are no other questions. So we'll go ahead and give you guys back two minutes of your day. Again, thank you everyone for, for joining us. We look forward to uh, seeing you guys again and a lot more great uh, content coming down the road.